introduced the classics of the old right, such as the essays of Garrett Garrett, to a whole generation of SDSers, Students for Democratic Society, that is, the main youth protest movement with chapters on hundreds of campuses. The effort had an effect on the more intelligent SDS leaders, such as Carl Oglesby, the group's first elected leader, who later quoted Garrett Garrett and favorably cited the old right's anti-imperialism in his book, Containment and Change. By that time, however, he had been purged from the group he had been instrumental in founding for the horrible crime of right-wing deviationism. SDS and the anti-war movement had by then gone into their ultra-left phase and went out in a blaze of botched bombings and self-destructive melodrama. Also at this point, the movement that gathered regularly in Rothbard's living room had grown too large to fit into that small space, and so the first libertarian activist conferences were being held, and the libertarian press was developing a pace. Aside from Rothbard's own libertarian forum, there was Reason Magazine, which started out as a staple 12-page fanzine, which I got the first issue of, and has since morphed into, well, we'll get to that. <laughs> this was supplemented by a plethora of local and national newsletters and amateur magazines which titles, uh, with titles such as Commentary on Liberty, The American Libertarian, The New Standard, and Invictus, to name the first that come to mind. The libertarian movement, which had always existed as a subset of conservatism, and then was thrust into bed with the far left, had grown to the point where it could finally maintain an independent organizational existence. It was only a matter of time until a libertarian party was founded, and that occurred in 1972, I believe. The story of how that came about is well known, perhaps to many of you, and I won't reiterate the trials, travails, and triumphs of that storied sect, since I could hardly do the subject justice in the time allotted to me. I just want to point out, however, that the LP has been the battlefield on which the whole question of how to function as an organized political movement has been fought. And as such, its history provides us with a rich source of material for our speculations as to the future of libertarianism, be it dark or bright. At first, the LP did not earn Rothbard's support. He thought it was far too early to found such a party and foresaw correctly limited electoral success for the venture. In any case, he was soon drawn into it, ineluctably it seems, and became a leading voice for consistency of principle, working hard to keep the party on a strictly anti-interventionist stance in the vital realm of foreign policy, in spite of the more conservative libertarians who never understood, and still don't, the key link between peace and liberty, and conversely, between statism and war. So the party grew, the movement grew, and by the late 1970s, Rothbards and his associates took it to the next level with the help of a generous benefactor whose largesse made possible a great leap forward in the pace and quality of libertarian activism. Let us go back to the year 1978 and look at what happened to the organized libertarian movement. Suddenly, there sprang up the Cato Institute, along with an array of satellite organizations, including a student group and the Libertarian Party itself, which became a cog in what we used to call the Coke machine. This mighty ideological center was made possible by the largesse of Charles G. Koch, an heir to the Koch family fortune and Koch Industries, one of the largest privately owned companies in the US. I believe it's the largest. The father, Fred C. Koch, had made his money in oil, engineering, and cattle, and I think owned the state of Kansas, and, and passed on his fortune to his sons, at least two of whom, Charles and David, shared his libertarian beliefs. Now from the outside looking in, all was well. Magazine and news, newspaper articles hailed libertarianism as the next big thing 
and profiles of the Institute and its spin-off groups published in the mainstream media glowed with admiration for their organization and enthusiasm, if not praise for their ideas. In the mid-1970s, when Charles Koch contacted Rothbard about what he could do to advance the movement's goals, the late great libertarian theorist wrote a long memo that projected the creation of a mighty apparatus of libertarian cadre organizing in virtually every arena of American political and intellectual life. Koch had the money, Rothbard had the vision. At, at, at the core of it all was Rothbard's conception of the Cato Institute, which, by the way, he came up with the name for, as a think tank devoted to a development, spread, and popularization of the Austrian School of Economics, free market solutions to social problems on the home front, a devotion to the preservation and expansion of civil liberties, and a consistent opposition to US imperialism. Now, this last theme was particularly important as far as Rothbard was concerned. It was the linchpin of his political stance as basically an old rightist, that is, a survivor of a time when the right side of the political spectrum in the United States was decidedly anti-interventionist, and it was the left that was calling for the jailing of anti-war protesters for sedition. Rothbard saw war as a progenitor of the collectivist revolution in America, and opposition to America's foreign policy of global intervention was, for him, necessarily the main focus of libertarians in the 20th century. One of Rothbard's many and major contributions to the growth and development of the organized libertarian movement in America was that he carried the anti-interventionist tradition of the 1930s and 1940s into the contemporary political scene. Waving the old banner of the America First Committee and laying the intellectual groundwork for the emergence of the Ron Paul phenomenon more than a decade after his death. Now, growing up alongside the Koch funded Cato Institute, like mushrooms in the shade of a giant tree, a whole network of special interest groups and periodicals sprouted. There was a student group and a movement magazine, Libertarian Review, uh, which was published in addition to the outreach magazine, Inquiry, which was aimed at high-tone liberals and libertarian fellow travelers in the media. These satellite organizations were all housed across the street from the glass and steel tower of the Cato Institute in an unassuming warehouse. The Libertarian Party also had an office in this complex and it was this particular component of the vast and mighty Coke machine that eventually caused all the trouble. The split between Rothbard and the Institute he had inspired and essentially founded was occasioned by the presidential campaign of 1980, which Rothbard was most unhappy with. In an incident which has become legendary in LP circles, the party's candidate, Edward Clark, an oil company lawyer, went on national television to explain to interviewer Ted Koppel that libertarianism was basically just, quote, low-tax liberalism, end quote. Now, this outraged Rothbard for any number of very good reasons, not the least of which was its strategic wrongheadedness. The Cato Institute's strategy was to target the elites especially in the media, but also in the two major political parties and in government circles. Rothbard, on the other hand, took a diametrically opposite view. He envisioned a populist revolt against the elites who profit from the maintenance and growth of state power. Libertarians, he believed, must make their appeal to ordinary people instead of aspiring to a position at court in in the hope, the vain hope, of whispering advice into the king's ear. It is necessary, he said, to appeal to the great masses of Americans so that libertarianism will become a living and vital political movement and not just an intellectual parlor game. 